Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Kevin here. Today I'll be interviewing someone special. His name is Sudan. He's from Sydney. Uh, Sudan, glad to have you here. Hi, thanks Kevin. Thanks for having me in your channel. Hi, welcome. Just in case you guys are blur and you don't know who he is, let me give you guys a quick background. So right now, Sudan is working as an investment lead at Sydney. He has written many of the articles that you have seen on Sydney. Before that, he was working as a freelance writer at Motley Fu having written over 2,000 articles for them. Sudan obviously knows more about investing than all of us here. Let's get right to asking him some questions. Lah. When do you start investing? Then what motivated you to start investing? Sure, sure, Kevin. So uh, I started investing back in like 2009. So it was like June 2009. And prior to that, I was uh, learning about investing. And even before that, I was actually doing trading. I started off in this personal finance investing journey back in national service. When in national service, I was, I was a sergeant. So with that um, small money, that uh, allowance that I got every month, I was trying to learn uh, how to budget my money. And that's where I came across uh, this book called Rich Dad Poor Dad yeah, by Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, ever since then, reading that book, it really changed my mind on like, how I see money and how I see um, everything to do with uh, investing and stuff. So I realized that um, we can't be uh, relying on monthly income to be financially secure. So that's when I got uh, other ways to grow money um, through, uh, firstly, it was trading. So I started trading uh, in national service. I was doing Forex, I was doing futures. And I realized that uh, looking at charts didn't really make sense to me. Like, you know, all these mo uh, moving averages, MACD, and you know, all the technical uh, stuff. It didn't really make sense. And after a while, I got exposed to uh, Warren Buffett Cockhorst way of investing, uh, looking at businesses and looking at um, whether the business is strong, whether the business is sustainable, mm -hmm. at financials. That way of um, growing money through investing made more sense to me. Uh, that was the same for me. La. I started as trading first, then I failed badly, then I moved over to investing. Other than to grow your money, do you have any actual plans to investing? So uh, why invest basically, uh, like I think everybody, why they invest to uh, grow their money, reach certain financial goals. And, and for me personally, I, I love investing because it's like an intellectual pursuit. By doing investing, I learn about companies. Uh, by learning about companies, I learn about different, different industries. Um, industries that I don't know nothing, don't know anything about. But once I look at their businesses, once I learn about um, those companies, the industry, I gain a lot, of, a lot more knowledge. So um, that's one thing I like about investing. Mm. Um, so for myself, uh, previously I was from engineering. Other than knowing engineering stuff, I can also learn about, uh, for example, uh, games, gaming, gaming technology, um, even learn about coding, uh, slight, slight things here and there that I wouldn't have uh, been exposed to otherwise. So I like this intellectual pursuit of uh, investing. So I didn't really start to like uh, make a lot of money uh, hmm. from investing. Just, I just felt that uh, investing uh, made sense to me in the sense. So uh, yeah, I just started investing and then never looked back. Do you have any plans for to achieve financial independence? I don't have any concrete plans. Like for example, okay. at age fifty, I need to be a uh, millionaire mm. or you know, be financially free. Uh, but I do have general plans um, mm. because financial freedom allows time freedom. So yeah. financial independence, you, know, you don't have to work, you know, keep on thinking about you know, how what's the next way to earn money and stuff like that. So financial independence gives financial uh, time freedom, and that's I think something that uh, I like. Yeah, and don't have to worry about money, where, where money will come from and stuff. How do you save money? Do you have any uh, finance tips and tricks that you can share? Sure. So uh, how I save money is once uh, every month I get my income, right? Uh, what I do is transfer 10% of that income to a sub-account within mm -hmm. that account. So, so I do this every month without fail. So it's a concept called paying yourself first because we are working for people, right? And, and if we don't pay ourselves first at the end of the day, I you know there's there's no like meaning meaning to it to what we are doing in a sense. So I feel that paying ourselves first is, is a is a good habit to, to do. So what I do is transfer ten percent out, and that ten percent I will use it for investments. So let's say I don't have anything to invest for that month, I would uh, know that money will basically accumulate there, and once I get good opportunities, I will then uh, invest that money. So it's always good to have a separate account uh, from your main salary account. Uh, what I do is I have a separate a stocks account in a sense, right? a bank account where all the money is parked there. So, uh, so that, that account is linked to my CDP account as well in Singapore uh, for Singapore stocks. Okay. And any dividends that I receive, it goes back into that particular bank account. So it doesn't get muddled up with my daily expenses and, and my salary. So you just uh, 
try to save 10% of your money, then uh, use those money to invest. Uh. What are you investing right now? Do you have any like top five stock picks that you can share? Okay, sure. So I'm a, I'm a long only uh, equity investor. So basically I don't short uh, stocks. So I invest for the long term. Um, mm-hmm. Time horizon wise, maybe uh, probably over five years, five, 10, 20, 30 years. So some of the stocks that I'm bullish about uh, include things like uh, micro mechanics in Singapore. So micro mechanics does a, a semiconductor, I see the semiconductor industry and they do tools and consumables for the industry. So I like the company because uh, there's a long tailwind for a long term tailwind for semiconductor. So in terms of 5G technology, in terms of uh, all these mobile phones, driverless cars, I think there's, there's a lot of growth potential in that particular uh, industry, technology industry. Uh, another company is uh, IFAS. I think this company a lot of people will be familiar with because I think it's one of the best performing Singapore stocks uh, so far. So I think fintech is only about only going to grow. Wealth management is only going to grow as people get uh, wealthier. The middle income uh, class grows. Uh, the other three more are, are basically more international, more US listed. First is DocuSign. So DocuSign they do uh, e signatures. I believe that you know, with, with with this work from home uh, trend and and uh, basically this work from anywhere trend. So in the future I think. Uh, we wouldn't really be uh, sitting in the office every day, uh, nine to five working. So, uh, so DocuSign is a company that um, enables this work from anywhere uh, economy. The okay. fourth one, uh, I like C Limited. So C Limited owns Garena, Shopee, and uh, C Money. So C Money is their fintech arm. Uh, there's a lot of growth potential in this part of the region with uh, e-commerce, uh, which with uh, still with gaming, and 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 they also want a license in Singapore. To, to operate a digital bank. And last but not least is Shopify. So Shopify is in the e-commerce uh, space also. So um, they enable small merchants or businesses to uh, set up their own, own website instead of ha- having, having those products on a, on a third-party platform or, or marketplace. So for example, Amazon, uh, if, if a business will start, they can either list it on Amazon's uh, website or they can basically have their own website uh, to, to direct people to go to the website to buy the products. So uh, that's the second part is where Shopify enables. So in summary, it's Micromechanics, iFast, DocuSign, C, and uh, Shopify. Yeah, for full disclosure, I own the stock, so uh, I might be biased. Yeah, I, think, I think it's quite interesting that you are not owning stocks that are popular in a, in a sense, like the FANG stocks right, right now, right? Uh, more people are promoting Tesla, Amazon, Facebook, Google, but your stock picks are more, uh, more regional in a sense. That's, yeah, I find that quite interesting. Uh. Actually, I own Google as well. So I have uh, Google shares. What I mentioned, I'm, I'm less in bullish in a sense on I see. Google. So um, other than stocks, do you own cryptos also? Yeah, actually, I just uh, bought, in, bought some crypto in May just this year, just to learn about what the crypto space is about. So I don't know anything about crypto space. Uh, I just learned a bit here and there. And, and I think the technology behind crypto is interesting, blockchain. Mm-hmm. And... Um, yeah, so just bought a bit to learn about the space and, and I'm willing to lose all the money uh, if, if you know, crypto doesn't take off. The normal advice is to have only 10% of cryptos in the portfolio. So I think, yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a good way to own cryptos. Uh. I think I just want to add one more thing, Kevin, mm. uh, regarding uh, risk, right? So an uh, uh, investing person I admire from the Motley Fool uh, in the US is uh, this person called, this investor called Tom Engel. So he once said that uh, if the investment works out, a little is all you need. But if it doesn't, a little is all you want. So I think, I think it makes, makes a lot of sense in terms of risk. So uh, not only for crypto, I think stocks also. If you expose too much of your money into a particular stock that, that uh, you don't know much about, or you, know, you, people, you hear people saying it's good, then you just buy it. I think it's risking too much. Mm. So... Because if it doesn't work out, then it's, it's like you, you bomb your whole portfolio. Yeah, I think risk management is very, very important in investing. More than right. making money, uh, taking care of downside is, is, is very, very important. Do you play with options? I don't invest, but I, right. I plan to do in the future. Ah, so okay. I don't use, uh, use options for stocks, but I plan to do that in the future. Speaking of options, I tried it earlier this year and uh, I, I felt it was quite eye-opening as it opened a lot, up a lot of possibilities to earn money. So yeah, you, you should try it out when you can. So you started quite a, quite a while already uh, in investing. Do you have any investment mistakes that you made along the way? Yeah, so actually I got a lot of mistakes. Uh, so I started in 2009. So I think it's been 12 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and also penned my like my mistakes in, in a blog article in for Sydney. Uh, it's called 11 lessons from 11 years of investing in the stock market. Mm -hmm. One of the major uh, mistakes I would say is uh, basically not venturing into the US market um, earlier. So I only ventured into the US market from Singapore stocks uh, in early 2018. I, I would have wanted to go in earlier because there's only so much Singapore stocks can grow. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of growth, there's much more potential in the US. Um, so not going to the US earlier actually cost me in terms of uh, opportunity cost. So no regrets for having ventured into the US. Yeah, especially after the COVID crash, um, I had the opportunity to invest a bit more in the US, so all good. See, for me, uh, I realized that US gives a lot more opportunities compared to Singapore stocks. So I also quite recently moved over only. I think there's a lot of home buyers for Singapore investors because we are very comfortable uh, in Singapore stocks. Right? It's very visible in the sense that, let's say you want to invest in a, in a REIT, you know, you just see a capital land, integrated commercial mm -hmm. trust uh, properties there. And, 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 and for example, if you want to invest in Sheng Xiong, you, you know Sheng Xiong is a good business, people are going in there and stuff. But uh, there's always a limitation for this kind of businesses. Because once you saturate the single market, you have to look overseas already. Yeah. Okay. But in the US, for example, businesses that can expand from one small state and then into many states and then even to the whole country. And even then, there's so much of growth potential, even before they venture out of the US. So this is something that uh, I think Singapore investors have to consider as well. As you know, uh, Singapore, there are a lot of people who want to start investing, especially recently with all the low-cost brokerage coming around. How do you think they should start investing? What are the first steps that they should take? I think the first step is always to uh, learn about what they are going to uh, invest in, gain the, the knowledge first. Um, you can always make money in the stock market because you know, the uh, market moves in cycles up and down. Market crash crashes every once in a while. We shouldn't be you know, kanchong to go and invest quickly. So gain the knowledge first and then slowly uh, invest your, your money. So some ways to gain knowledge uh, include you know, Kevin Dunn's investing YouTube channel. He has a lot of great ads that I've seen. Yeah, so and reading one. silly articles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. CD as well. Yeah. So yeah. we have a lot of investment guides on, uh, on Sydney, like the beginner's guide to investing, like what is a CDP account, uh, how do you open a brokerage account, like uh, what are things to do before even you invest. So, um, so what are things to do before you invest include uh, paying off any high interest debt uh, that you own, any loans that you have, uh, any high interest credit card loans. It's uh, better to pay them off first before starting to invest. Uh, because uh, yeah, credit card interest, for example, they, get, they, they ask for 24% of mm. interest back. Uh, but the stock market average, you can only make around 10%. Mm. Uh, so there's, you basically lose money when you invest in the stock market instead of paying uh, off your high interest rate. Uh, next thing to do is basically to have at least six months of emergency funds uh, before you invest. Because if anything were to happen, touch wood, uh, you know, you have a job or anything, uh, you don't have to liquidate your investments to pay off your monthly, daily expenses. Uh, that's the second one. The third one is to basically get adequate insurance protection. So uh, always protect your downside before you, know, you look for upside. So insurance, uh, helps us to protect our, our downside in case something happens, we have to be hospitalized and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's in terms of the basics. <clears throat> then we only should also invest uh, any money that we don't need in the next five years. Because mm -hmm. uh, the stock market is very, very volatile. It can move up and down uh, anywhere between uh, above 30, 40% to below uh, a draw, uh, drawdown of 20, 20, 10, 20% at uh, any time. So we should only invest money that we don't need. Uh, so let's say you want the money for renovation loans in the next one year, you want to use the money for BTO, uh, please don't put it in the stock market uh, unless uh, you are really, 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 really sure that you don't need the money yeah, or, or you have other means to pay off for your renovation loans. If not, uh, it's better to put it into a high interest bank account or cash management funds and stuff like that. So we even have uh, articles on that, like cash management funds to look out, to put your money in uh, for the short term. Yeah, so once you have gained all this enough knowledge, then you can look into uh, probably with uh, exchange traded funds or ETFs. Uh, ETFs are basically uh, instruments that hold a diversified portfolio of stocks. So in the, in the Singapore market, there's the popular Straits Times Index ETF, uh, which owns 30 of the Singapore uh, Straits Times Index stocks. Mm -hmm. The US, the S&P 500 ETF, which owns uh, 500 plus of the companies in the US. So those are some ways. Um, another way is to probably invest in robo advisors. They also have to invest in ETFs and, and many other funds uh, that you can diversify very easily. 
So on CD also, we have a lot of reviews on mobile devices that uh, the viewers can check out. So basically, it's to uh, have your bases covered, like pay off any high interest debt, um, have six months emergency savings. Then only after that, uh, you can invest the money that you don't need in the short term. Yeah. Uh, so to add the six months part, uh, it actually also depends on uh, whether uh, your, your personal circumstances. For example, if you're, you're self-employed, you might want to have uh, more than six months of expenses. Mm. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, maybe a, a bit more. Or uh, on the other hand, if you're uh, a salary employee and you have steady income every month, uh, probably six months uh, makes sense. Recently, there's a movement called meme investing. Uh, gaining popularity like GameStop, AMC and stuff. What are your thoughts about that? So back to the basics. Uh, in investing, we have to know uh, what a company does, how it makes money, and whether there's future potential for growth. So if if those companies that um, the Reddit stocks, Reddit forums talk about, if they have this kind of potential, this kind of um, fundamentals, I think I think by all means, if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're investing, uh, go go and invest in them. But uh, if it's all about making money in the short term, momentum trading, uh, making quick bucks, I think they should be comfortable to uh, lose the money in the sense. So there's always risk involved in this kind of momentum trading, momentum uh, chasing momentum. So like similar to crypto, uh, what I mentioned earlier, uh, we must be willing to put money that we're willing to lose uh, in these kind of investments. So. Yeah, so just know uh, what you're getting into. Don't just buy meme stocks because you know, your friends say so and you can make money in AMC, GameStop. But because you've done uh, research yourself, mm. yeah, your own diligence and, and because at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're responsible for your own money. Your, friend will, your friends will be responsible for your own money. Yeah. So it's not just apes to get a strong. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, if you have diamond hands in a particular stock, make sure you, are, you have fundamentally researched and you, can, you are sure that you no. Know, 10, 20 years later, you still be able to do well. This is a question that I would like to ask you because it's, it's about my own portfolio. Uh, as some of you might know, I have 75% in Tesla stocks. Is it good for me to concentrate my investment in just a few stocks or is it better to diversify? I think uh, it depends on the individual investor. Uh, mm. the, the, it's a very uh, tricky space. So uh, there's, no, there's no right or wrong answer. So uh, well-known investors like Warren Buffett, they, they tend to concentrate their portfolio. Uh, on the other hand, uh, investors like Peter Lynch, they have uh, a lot of stocks. So, and both also have, both camps have made money in the long term. Uh, very, very good returns. Mm -hmm. So I think it uh, depends on the investor. So if uh, Kevin, you can sleep well at night, I think, uh, I think you have a very good portfolio. But if you worry every day, you can't sleep at night uh, about your 75% Tesla allocation, I think, uh, it might be good to really look, really look into that allocation also. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on, on that individual investor. How, how do you feel about your portfolio? Do you, can you sleep well at night with having so much in Tesla? Um, I, 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 I can. <laughs> I can sleep well at night um, because I've, I, I feel that I have done enough research into the stock. But it's also my responsibility to question whether my decision is right or wrong. Even if I can sleep well at night, I have to ask myself whether it's the right move or not. Mm. If I were you, I wouldn't want to have too much in Tesla, like in a particular company. Lah. So I would, what I would do is, uh, as you see, there's a saying in the stock market this, that goes, uh, winners keep on winning. Mm. So strong companies keep on winning. So Tesla can you know, keep on winning uh, with a long-term tailwind that it, it might have. Um, but by the same time, uh, having too much exposure to a certain company makes me uncomfortable. So what I would do is probably... Um, take some money away and, mm. and uh, invest in other companies or even index invest in an index fund that um, probably can grow on, at a steady basis at 10%. Then when opportunity arises again, I probably can trim off some of the index fund allocation and then you know, put back into uh, Tesla if it corrects. Okay, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, is it better to invest in growth stocks or dividend stocks? Uh, I think back to the individual's uh, preferences or circumstances. Mm. So for example, uh, if, if, if the investor is very young, for example, in the 20s, early 20s, he, has, uh, he or she has many, many years to go to before retirement, um, probably like 40, 30, 40 years to retirement. I think in that sense, um, growth stocks might be a better option for the person. 
Uh, on the other hand, if the person is going to retire, uh, going to hit retirement in five years, for example, or it's already retired, I think uh, dividend stocks may make more sense. Uh, one, because there's income coming in from dividend stocks. And second is dividend stocks are uh, usually mature businesses. So for example, um, companies like SGX, they're more mature. Hmm. Or companies like Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson in the US. So they're more mature and they give steady dividends year after year. So uh, in that sense, there's uh, less business risk um, when they put their money into these kind of companies. Uh, no doubt there's always risk in investments uh, in all companies, but uh, in terms of uh, risk compared to a growth company, it might be lesser. And that uh, less risk might suit a dividend investor or income uh, investor who's already retired. Dividend companies also tend to be less volatile because there's also, because the companies give out dividends, there's a, there's a flaw to where the stock might fall. I know, I know it's a bit, a bit like market timing or a bit technical, but uh, because there's dividend coming in, uh, the market sees it, and if it drops too much, people will go in and and, and scoop up the shares because it's a very good dividend yield at a certain price. So there's always a flaw uh, for dividend companies compared to uh, non-dividend paying companies. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The dividend sort of supports the stock price. Is something I noticed uh, happening on and off. Quite recently, uh, I think China stocks have been going down quite a bit. There are people believing that China stocks will play out quite well in the future. But what's your thought on this, uh, whether it's good to invest in China stocks or not? I think over the long term, uh, China is a very uh, good country, a, a good place to invest in. Um, basically because there's a lot of potential in the companies that, that, they, that they serve. Um, your Tencent, your Alibaba's, and you know, your Meituan's. So there's a lot of growth in the, in the country itself in terms of population growth, in terms of um, uh, middle income, uh, the pop the, uh, I mean the the way I mean the middle income group growth, mm -hmm. yeah, different classes, yeah. Over the long term, I think China is a good country to go into. Uh, but I think the short term, there's always this risk in regulation. Uh, the Chinese government clamping down on stocks. Uh, I think regulations are good. To, to regulate the market now because it's, now it's a bit like free for all where any company can come in and any China company, Chinese company can uh, set up business and, and do a lot of things. But I think with regulations, the incumbents will become even stronger actually in my view. So regulations actually help, help companies like Tencent, Alibaba. So I don't buy uh, specific uh, China stocks for myself. Even though I like certain companies like Tencent, I invest in them through an ATM. So I have a the Lion OCBC Tech Index, Hang Seng Tech Index oh, ETF, okay. which was listed. So I previously owned um, this index, this ETF called KWEB. So I used to own that, and then I sold off all that, all, all my position in that, and transferred my money to the, the Lion OCBC ETF. Um, mainly because the KWEB invests in US uh, uh, American depository receipts called ADRs. So do, they don't directly invest in uh, Tencent, Hong Kong listed Tencent, or you know the Alibaba listed in Hong Kong. They invest in the ADRs listed in the US. So there's this added risk where you know when US clamps down on China um, ADRs overseas listings, um, there's a risk where these kind of investments may may uh, may go to zero. We wouldn't know what will eventually happen, but there's always this risk. So I'd rather invest directly into uh, Hong Kong listed China stocks. And what's your outlook on the market in the next five years? My outlook is uh, I don't have any outlook, <laughs> so I, I don't invest uh, with, with the, like the next one, two, three, five years in mind. Uh, I, I basically concentrate on the businesses itself, look at the business fundamentals, whether the business can still make money in the next five years. So if uh, if it can make money in the next five, 10, 20 years, I think uh, it's, it's a good investment. So I don't look at the inflation, uh, whether you know, there's always talk about inflation now, right? People are scared about inflation. But I don't worry about all those macroeconomic mm. issues. Yeah, I just focus on the business itself. Yeah, yeah, so as long as the company is good, it will always do well no matter what's the market condition. So exactly, I think I think the case in point was last year, uh, during COVID, people were scared that you know during because of COVID, businesses will get hit and stocks won't do well. But actually, a lot of stocks like the tech stocks actually did it very very well, and COVID actually accelerated their, their performance. Mm. So. Uh, there's always these macro fears to, to worry about. There's always something to worry about every day in terms of uh, the stock market. 
uh, because now it's inflation, then tomorrow will be probably something else. If we are confused with all this market noise, right, I think we wouldn't really be investing. Uh, we probably be like, worrying about the, the, the market conditions and moving in and out of the stocks, mm. like the stock market, which is actually not good uh, over the long term. Uh, yeah, I think that's all for this interview. Uh, thanks for answering the questions. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, your questions actually made, made me reflect as well as why, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, so thanks for the questions as well. Okay, I will, I will take your Tesla suggestion. <laughs> into account <laughs> when balancing my portfolio. Yeah, okay. So so thanks a lot. And see you next time. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye.